This is the Sports and Society Podcast, where we go beyond scores, statistics, and personalities to focus on issues and controversies in sports worlds. Your hosts, Jake Oakley and Jeff Montes de Oca, are sports sociologists and the authors of the book, Sports and Society, Issues and Controversies. The episodes in this podcast give you a behind-the-scenes look at the textbook with stories from our lives as scholars and athletes, as well as providing analysis of ongoing issues and controversies in contemporary sport worlds. We welcome hearing your thoughts and analysis, so please use this space to engage with us about the textbook or any of the topics we cover in this podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Sports and Society podcast. Hi, Jay. How are you doing today? Pretty good, Jeff. So, and and you're looking good. And how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> So this is going to be our first episode that that focuses on a specific chapter. Uh, We're going to be talking through chapter one uh, of the book, Sports and Society. And the way I thought maybe we should begin this episode is, Jay, maybe we can just take a moment and talk about what is sport. And I think this is really important because we've all grown up around sports We sort of intuitively know what sports are, but once you start actually thinking about like a definition of sport, it gets really complicated. It does. And, and it's a great question because, uh, what counts as sport is oftentimes a a contested issue and, uh, and people with power and influence are oftentimes those who define what counts as sport in an official sense. So, uh, but when we think about a definition, generally people want to include competition uh, in that definition, but that raises some issues. Uh, What about challenges that don't involve a direct competition with another person or with another team, like mountain climbing, for example, or rock climbing? And uh, when you're doing that as part of a group, and you certainly think you're doing sport, but it's not competition, it's it's a challenge. And that's a little bit different. So uh, the other thing that people include in, in most definitions is it has to be physical. And for the most part, most of us in, in sports sociology would agree with that, but When I went to the Soviet Union back in 1980, uh, right before the Olympic Games uh, that they sponsored, I went to their training center and the first thing I saw when I walked in were all of these soundproof booths and telephones and chess boards because their Olympic committee considered chess to be a sport. And, and they sponsored chess players as athletes in the same way. So, so basically, the definition is a political thing, and, uh, and it's generally influenced by the people who have power and control in connection with sport in s- organizations. Well, that's great because what you're talking about is sport as an institution, but also how different institutions come together to define something as sport at any given time or place. Let's think about that in the sense of, all right, there are certain things we just know are sports, football, basketball, baseball, skiing, swimming, so on and so forth. There's all these there's all these sports, they either have professional leagues or they're in the Olympics and, and whatnot. And so we can accept those as sports. But then there's other things. And, and one of my favorite examples is the blood sports. Dogfighting, cockfighting, bull baiting, when uh, people would sick dogs to kill a bull or bear baiting, same thing, but they'd kill a bear with dogs, uh, fox hunting, all of these things that were sports when when the word sport came into the English language, but we don't tend to think of them as sports anymore. Conversely, there's other things that are becoming called sports. Um, 
esports, for instance, cheerleading a- as a sport, uh, increasingly uh, student led games such as Quidditch. You know, is Quidditch a sport? Is it not a sport? Uh, how, how do you answer that question, Jay? Yeah, well, I have a I have another example I want to just throw in there before I try to answer that, and that is there's a college in in the east that just developed a cornhole team, and they've given two scholarships to the two best high school age cornhole players in the United States. So they're going to school for free. It's it's a Division three school, but uh, but in their athletic department, they have cornhole. So, uh, so basically, a sport is, in terms of our taken for granted sports, uh, is an activity that has a governing body, a rulemaking body, uh, uh, that that gives the activity its official character, and we take those for granted and. Uh, if we look at at the connection between cultural traditions and and culture in general and what counts as a sport, we can see that as culture changes, so do the kinds of things that we call sports. And your your examples are classic there because as people have have. Uh, take an offense at dogs fighting each other or a bull being killed or a fox being shot, they're no longer considered official sports. And, you know, when I grew up, there was a magazine called Sports Afield, and it was like Sports Illustrated, and it covered all those. And many people just took for granted that those things were sports. Now people have objected and... uh, and the legitimacy of those activities as sports has had been questioned, and that's part of what sport is all about. Is uh, it cha- they change along with culture and along with the norms that exist in society? So, just maybe one more question. We might have two more questions on on this topic because it, it is complicated, a- and I'm thinking about like. So I love in class to ask if cheerleading is a sport or not. And students get really um, heated in the, when we have this discussion because invariably there's somebody that would say a football or basketball player in high school, like they competed and they're like, oh no, cheerleading is not a sport. And invariably there's a student who was a cheerleader in high school and they argue cheerleading is absolutely a sport. And and I think this gets to the politics of this definition. Why, why are people, why do you think people get so invested in saying something is or isn't a sport? Like if I'm a cheerleader, why would I want to demand cheerleading should be called a sport? Or if, if I'm a gamer, why might I demand gaming be called esports. What is it about that word sport that gets people so worked up? Yeah, well, first of all, when you use the word sport, you're legitimizing a particular activity as official in some way, shape, or form. And and that officialness oftentimes comes with sponsorships. It comes with uh, a support from friends and family and and community and uh, and it leads to the acquisition of status if you're a participant and it also connects you with other people who are official participants so you know that's part of of what we call in sociology an institutionalization process where something that starts out as an informal activity just between friends starts to become increasingly formalized uh in increasingly governed by external uh organizations or individuals and eventually becomes an official sport when there's an official governing body uh, or like in the United States, you know, the, the national federations that we have for Olympic sports or in high schools, the official high school sports. And uh, and 
by the way, that that raises an interesting issue for me. You know, in high schools, a lot of the sports are the sports that all of the students' grandfathers played. And uh, not their grandmothers, by the way, in many cases. So, you know, the official definitions of sport came out of the experiences and preferences of men, not women. So there's a gender issue connected with what counts as an official sport. And that's where we get into cheerleading a little bit. Uh, you know, cheerleading came out of a gender definition related to femininity uh, where females are the emotional guiders of family members, of friends, uh, and in the case of cheerleading, crowds. They kind of emotionally guide a crowd through a game. Well, is that a sport? Well, it's not competitive, so I'll tell you what. Let's create cheer instead of cheerleading, and we'll make it competitive. And it's certainly physical, and it certainly is demanding in terms of skills. And by the way, it has an injury rate that rivals football for for boys in high school. And the injuries are oftentimes really serious. So this is a physical competitive uh, activity, cheer. And it's becoming increasingly popular in the United States, at least. Uh, it hasn't made its way too much to other parts of the world where gymnastics is grounded in their cultural traditions in, in a way that cheer and cheerleading has been grounded in the traditions of the United States. Yeah, and that's such a great point. And and cheerleading is so interesting in this regard that and, and I don't know that other countries have a history of cheerleading the way we do in the United States. And, and one of the things that people don't realize is originally cheerleaders were all men, that uh, sport was so sex segregated that there wasn't space for women. My my recollection of the history is Southern colleges in the U.S. South started having female cheerleaders in the 1920s. By the 1940s and 1950s, all schools had, or I should say, female cheerleaders were common across the country. But when you read through the early issues of Sports Illustrated, there's a lot of cartoons in there. And cartoons, right, they, they express the sentiments, the anxieties of a particular time. And there were a lot of cartoons about cheerleaders being present it within the masculine space of football and how disruptive their sexuality is in that space and so we can see as recently as the 1950s uh people were trying to work out anxieties around women being in this what had been a very homosocial highly segregated sporting space and so these things, they change over time. Um, I, I, for me, I think the, the claiming of sport is tied to the way that our dominant sports have been commercialized. And when you start making claims about this activity as a sport, it allows you access to that, the, those institutions and there's a commercial model that you can then tap into. Yeah, and and that's really interesting when you look at the history of cheerleading because initially, like you say, it was men in their university sweater and the logo on their sweater uh, doing the cheerleading. And, uh, and then when women entered, uh, a lot of people saw them as invaders of this male space. And uh, and for them to become legitimized within that space, they had to take on the characteristics of femininity as it was defined. And we can see that just in the uniforms that cheerleaders wear, uh, and uh, especially in professional football and in the NFL, where the cheerleader uniforms now uh, are uh, ex expose 
the bodies of of the women who are cheering and and so in other words in order to be legitimate in that space the women had to conform with traditional norms related to femininity it's almost like when women started playing tackle football they in order to get attention and some legitimacy they started a lingerie league and they played in lingerie with shoulder pads and helmets and uh, in order to attract attention because if they had dressed just like men do in football they would have been ignored uh, or defined as invaders and excluded uh, in, in some kind of an assertive way but when they're out there in bras and and uh, and panties with with shoulder pads on and a helmet on, uh, they were defined as legitimate in in kind of a crazy way, and that's kind of, that's what's happened to a lesser degree with cheerleading. If you're going to be in space in a male space as a woman, you better start looking like a woman. Yeah, the, I, I don't want to get started on the lingerie league. Uh, I actually spent some time researching that and then the foxy boxing. But one of the things that's really fascinating, and, and I want to bring it back to where we we, we started, I, I always point this out to, so I, I, it's a great point, the way in which cheerleading needed to be gendered, given the culture uh, from the 1920s through the 1950s when modern cheerleading was defined as I high, high as highly he, a heterosexual feminine aesthetic. Now it's interesting when my students make the argument, oh no, cheerleading absolutely is a sport. They're making a claim to a masculine model. They're trying to masculinize uh cheerleading by saying it is about yes, when we're when we're cheering for the football or basketball team, it's not a sport. But when we're at a competition, it is a sport because we're not being supportive on the sidelines. We're at the center and we're being aggressive. So we've spent a long time talking through like just what is sport, right? And, and this is just the very beginning. Maybe we can connect this to what the textbook is about, which is the sociology of sport. And um, what, what is it about like, the sociology of sport that would lead us to spend so much time just talking about something that most people think is really simple and obvious. What is sport? Yeah, I, well, sport is definitely a social activity. And, and uh, what is defined as sport oftentimes varies from one culture to another. And so uh, in other words, sport occurs in a social and cultural context. And that's what the sociology of sport is all about. They look at the connection between various kinds of movement and physical activities and the culture and society within which they occur and how the definitions of sport and the meanings given to those activities are all tied with what's going on in the culture at a particular point in time. So, you know, getting back to our, our past points is that uh, sports in the United States were created by and for men. And so there was this model of what counted as a sport that, that systematically excluded women. And it took the better part of a century for women to be intentionally and uh, graciously and enthusiastically embraced as athletes in particular kinds of activities. But those activities were all based pretty much on the, on the original models created by and for men. So that put that put females, girls and women, at a, at a disadvantage when it came to certain kinds of acceptance as athletes. So, you know, you got acceptance when you played like a man. And I remember in Colorado Springs when I was hanging out with the swimmers and divers there, the, the best compliment a woman could, could get as a diver was, you're diving like a man. 
And so, in other words, you had to move away from femininity in order to be identified as an athlete. But there was a catch-22 there. If you moved too far away, then your sexuality was questioned. So then women had to adopt what we call the female apologetic. They started thinking about makeup before they went out on the field. Uh, they, they wanted to present themselves uh, physically in conformity with traditional norms gender norms related to femininity. So uh, in order for women to be accepted, they had to make compromises in terms of how they became involved in sport. And, and gradually those compromises are starting to be worked out. And now we have women who are actually wearing football equipment and playing football. And in fact, flag football is the fastest growing sport for young women in high school right now. So, uh, so we're moving away uh, as ideas about gender change. To, uh, we're moving away from that compulsory femininity. But there still is that female apologetic. And, you know, you can see it on the basketball court uh, when when young women in college have their makeup on, uh, their hair combed just right, and oftentimes little uh, accents to their, uh, not to their official uniform, but to their own presentation of self that fit within the context of definitions of femininity. We'll be coming back to this discussion of the female apologetic um, or the feminine apologetic in a few episodes when we get to the chapter on gender. We'll have a lot to say uh, about it then, too, because it's a very it's interesting. It's complicated. And as you said, Jay, it's changing. It, it's not the way it was in the 1970s and 80s. Um, but one of the things I think that's for a lot of us who who do the sociology of sport that's really exciting about it is that it's both very international and it's very interdisciplinary now you and i both were trained in the discipline of sociology we're both located in the united states and so we have a pretty much a pretty strong u.s uh perspective on sport but but being in the sociology of sport it challenges us because we have to be interdisciplinary and we have to understand sport internationally. Maybe, Jay, you could talk a little bit about what makes the sociology of sport, do you think, so interdisciplinary and so inherently international? Yeah, well, on the one hand, uh, sports sociology is, is interdisciplinary because life is interdisciplinary. <laughs> And, and when you're trying to get a handle on a new topic, you know, disciplinary boundaries oftentimes get a little porous. Uh, and, you know, when, when I first started talking about uh, sport and studying it from a sociological perspective, I found myself moving into social psychology, into psychology occasionally, into political science and uh political economy and, uh, and, and education. So, in other words, sport crossed so many disciplinary lines that in order to understand it, people had, had contributions to make from different disciplines. And that's one of the things that I really find fun about the sociology of sport is that uh, there is space for people coming from other disciplines. And sport management is the classic one right now. Uh, sport parts of sport management are what I would call applied sociology. And now more and more people who are teaching in sport management programs are coming to sociology of sport conferences. Uh, their programs have a sociology of sport course in them. And they're concerned about sport as a social phenomenon. And that's that's what you've got to do if you want to market uh, and if you want to manage. So let, let me shift gears a little bit. And um, 
One of, I think one of the hallmarks of the sociology of sport is that we, we look at sport through a critical lens. You know, for instance, I'll oftentimes say sports psychology is trying to build a better mousetrap. And where a sports sociology is saying, hey, it's a trap, mouse. <laughs> so since 1978, when you first, the first year you published uh, Sports and Society, you've, you've always taken a critical approach to sports. So maybe you could talk a little bit first about what it means to study sport critically and then also address what, why you think it's important that we study sport critically. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, there's there's some confusion about the meaning of the word critical. <laughs> and basically, critical means a couple of different things. It means that we don't th take things at face value. Uh, when we see something that people accept on the basis of common sense or just take for just take for granted as as uh, being the right way to do things. Uh, we ask questions about that. So we look under what's an easily observable veneer taken for granted by people. And we ask questions about what that activity is about. Who, who participates in it? For what reasons? What kinds of impact does it have on people? Who's included in the activity? Who's excluded from the activity? We start asking all sorts of sociological questions uh, that raise critical issues about an activity that's taken for granted. So as researchers, we always learn to be skeptical about taken for granted things, uh, about things in our culture and society. So we ask questions that dig into those and we try to find out what's going on in them, fully going on in terms of so in terms of, of social relationships and in terms of uh, who's privileged, who isn't, who's included, who's excluded, and who's in control. So those are, yeah, those are the kinds of critical issues that we're concerned about. I mean, it really seems to me that when we talk about critical in the way you're, way you're defining this term, Jay, is we're really applying reason to sport and, and other social and cultural formations so that we can understand it empirically. What are the implications it has on people's everyday lives? both positive and negative. Because a lot of times when you hear the word critical, criticism, we think of it as a synonym for negative feedback. But within this, there's also a very positive vision of sport. So maybe you can also talk a little bit about how a critical approach to sport allows you to advance a positive image of sport. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question because uh, because when we use the term critical, we're not saying that we don't like sports uh, in in some kind of a general way. So you and I both grew up playing sports. We enjoyed sports, but uh, uh, along the way, we started asking questions about how sports were looked at within our culture, how they're organized and uh, and who participates in them. So we started asking those critical questions. It didn't mean we didn't like sport. What it meant was we wondered how the organization might be changed to make sports more humane, more accessible, to a greater number of people, more participants centered, and more enjoyable for people of all ages and all backgrounds and characteristics. That because we liked sports so much. So so we started asking questions about how sport was organized because we wanted to make it an activity that that people could participate in and have it contribute uh, in, a, in a direct way to their own development, their relationships, 
and to society. So what kinds of changes have, have to be made uh, to, to make sport that way? And those, that's basically one of the things that we're focusing on in the sociology of sport. We're, we're trying to improve it in a way that makes it more inclusive and humane and accessible and enjoyable. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's funny because if you look at most of my writing, it's all very critical. A and I think about why I take such a critical approach growing up. I was given a very idealistic image of maybe utopian even image of sport about how it's good for our health physically, good for health mentally, it's good for communities. There's all these different promises that we were given as kids, um, you know, regarding sport. And, and and then as we get older and we, we take a more uh, nuanced understanding of the world that we live in, we realized there was a lot of myth there and we'll, we'll come back to the great sports myth in, in a few minutes, but, but, but to a certain degree, uh, I, I bought into the great sports myth and, and, and I want to see it be true. And, and I think that's why I engage in sport so critically as a scholar, because I want the promise I was given as a child to be fulfilled. And so we try to push this institution towards what we, we all know it could be. Exactly. And, and in my experience, I came to a similar place, as you did, uh, in connection with all of the informal and pickup games that I played. Uh, and, and I've more recently called those things people's sports. They're created by and for the participants. And as I, as I participated in those kinds of sports, uh, I saw that they had to be changed, they had to be created in a way that kept the game going, kept people in the game, and so to speak. So we, we took the basic structure of baseball, for example, and we modified it so that when somebody who wasn't just a great hitter came up, we'd move the mound in a little bit and we'd pitch real easy so they could hit the ball. Because what are the three things that you enjoy most about baseball? It's hitting, catching, and running. And so we wanted that batter to hit the ball so that we could catch it and get things going on defense. So basically, um, those, those people sports are, are classic forms of play. They allowed people to be spontaneous and creative. And, and I really valued that growing up. So when I got into organized sports, I liked organized sports, but I noticed something. Some of the playfulness was disappearing. Uh, the spontaneity, the personal expression, it was all being governed now by this, uh, within this institutionalized structure. And so that's one of the issues that, that got me thinking critically about how we can make that institutionalized structure uh, more uh, participatory for athletes uh, and give them opportunities to express themselves and to be spontaneous and creative. So that was part of the reason that I was asking critical questions about how sport was organized. You know, that, that leads into another question for me. So we were both sociologists. We both study sport critically because sociology is, is a critical discipline. Um, what about people from other disciplines, students who aren't sociology majors? And I'm thinking in particular, people say in sport management, what would you say they have to gain from studying sport in a critical way, the way that we do? Mm hmm. Yeah. Now that's 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 a tough question in some ways, but uh, but if you're in sport management, uh, 
What you want to do is you want to understand how sports are are organized and and how they can be governed in ways that help them grow. And uh, and asking critical questions about how sport is organized is one way to find out information that would lead to changes that would stimulate growth so uh, so that's one of the one of the factors that people in sport management might, might want to be concerned about uh, they might also want to ask questions about whether sport is doing the developmental things that we claim that are being claimed in the great sport myth you know the great sport myth is basically this notion that sport is naturally pure and good and anybody who participates in sports shares in that purity and goodness it, it gets transmitted to the participants so what happens then is that sport automatically leads to the development, the positive development of the participants and the communities that sponsor it. So uh, so if you start asking critical questions about that, uh, what you find out is that sport may not be living up to that promise because the myth has led people to assume that certain kinds of things happen. Therefore, we don't have to study it in order to uh, improve sport because sport is already the way it should be. And if that's the orientation that you bring in to sport management or to your own family or your own participation in sport or your own community, you are missing opportunities for understanding, for making changes to help sport live up to that very promise that you've accepted without question. I have a very concrete example of what you're talking about, Jay. So I had a student, he was a he was a master student here at UCCS, which is in Colorado Springs. We're known as the Olympic City. One of the um, U.S. Olympic and Paralympic training centers is located here. And this student of mine, this former student, he um, was working for U.S. Cycling. And he was a graduate student. He started a pretty low level position working for U.S. Cycling, but he could not help but take a critical perspective on the way that U.S. Cycling operates because he was getting a degree, a master's degree in sociology. And he started talking to some of the people uh, that were that were running uh, U.S. Cycling at the time. And, and And this was when all of the sexual abuse scandal was breaking in U.S. gymnastics that would when we'll talk about that in another episode but that turned into one of the the biggest scandals in in sports in in U.S. history uh incredibly consequential so he started telling the people he worked for look the things that we are doing is leading towards a lawsuit that we could be the next U.S. gymnastics or the next U.S. swimming that got it got themselves into an awful lot of trouble. And the people he worked for said, do you have any evidence? And he said, I don't. Uh, I don't have any collected, but I could put it together. So then he took the skills he had developed studying sociology and he applied those. You know, you talk about sport management as applied sociology. He applied those skills both the theoretical and the methodological perspectives to U.S. cycling, and he put together a report. And long story short, it got him promoted. Uh, they wanted him to do a lot more of that, and he ended up managing the velodrome on the, at the at the training center there, uh, where the the cycling team trains when they're at when they're at home. Uh, he's since moved on from that, but. It was incredibly important to reforming U.S. cycling, and he brought to the people that were running, you know, U.S. cycling, their attention, things they never saw, they never thought about, and they were grateful that he had a sociological, a critical sociological perspective. Yeah, and you've just opened up the door 
for uh, for a critical examination of sport from an athlete's perspective, in a sense. Uh, although, what's happened? What happens in sport organizations is that athletes have no power. <laughs> And, you know, it's the managers and the coaches who have power and and the athletes are just going along with things. But once they start looking at sport as from an outside perspective, which you and I have done after, you know, as we got into sociology, we start to see things that should be noted and used and discussed and used as a basis for uh, considering changes. And this has happened, or st it's, it started to happen in all sorts of contexts. Uh, for example, uh, with the Olympics, there's a lot of communities and, and nations that won't bid on the Olympics anymore because all of the great things that were assumed to happen as a host city for the Olympics have not been happening. Those cities have gone deep in debt. Uh, the common good wasn't promoted through the, the hosting of the Olympics. Uh, a lot of people were disadvantaged. They were dislocated from their homes because of the expansion of facilities and so on and so forth. We'll talk about this again in a later, in a later session. But, uh, but finally, the people at the IOC are starting to understand, unless we start asking critical questions about this whole bid process and sponsorship and hosting experience, uh, we're going to end up with nobody who wants to host the games. So, because there's all sorts of problems associated with it. The Olympics didn't automatically lead to urban development. It didn't auto automatically lead to improvements within the nations that hosted the Olympics. So, what do we have to do in order to change things so that what we assumed would happen will happen? And that's a sport management issue. And that's not only happening with with uh, uh, the IOC. It's happening in the NCAA. It's happening in other sport organizations uh, where they're seeing, unless we start to look at sport critically and see what's going on, it's going to fade away in in the form that that we're trying to maintain. So sport is an emergent phenomenon, just like any other social and cultural phenomenon. It changes over time. And if we start saying, well, sport is naturally this way and it can never change, then sport's going to become less popular. Uh you're really touching on getting to get us back to a discussion of the great sports myth. But um, before we do that, uh, one more question along the, the lines of, of critical and the word critical in the United States in recent years, there's been a lot of debate and um, anxiety over the term critical race theory. Maybe you can talk a little bit, Jay, about how, how your critical sociological perspective relates to what gets called critical race theory. Yeah, it's, it's a really close relationship in a sense because uh, sociology is always looking beneath common, uh, uh, common sense kinds of explanations, taken for granted explanations of why things are the way they are. And... Uh, and as you ask those questions, you undoubtedly start wondering, why do we have the, the kinds of race relations that exist within our culture? Why do we have the kinds of gender relations, social class relations that exist in our, in our country? And to answer those questions, you have to look uh, below the surface, so to speak. You have to go back into history. You have to look at legal decisions that were made. And that's where critical race theory comes from, is uh, all of the precedents that were set in legal decisions over the past 150 years in the United States that ended up creating a context, a cultural and social context that worked 
to the advantage of of white people and to the disadvantage of black people in particular, but uh, people from various ethnicities in general. So, uh, but when you start talking about that, you you automatically step on toes because people have gained wealth and power and status within established structures. And if you start raising questions about those structures and the norms that that kind of make them work the way they do, then you're going to you're going to get resistance. And when those people use their power and wealth, that resistance can hurt you. It's dangerous to ask critical questions under certain circumstances. Uh, in the United States, we have more freedom to do that than people in some other cultures do, where nobody's asking critical questions, because if you do, you're going to get jailed. So uh, critical race theory has become a hot issue because some people think that you're asking questions that are going to change the way culture and society are organized and uh, and they see that as threatening so right now that's become an issue and those of us in sociology are coping with it and in fact as i you and i revise this book we have to be thinking about how can we present the research in sociology that's based on uh, asking critical questions, the research on race and ethnicity that's based on asking critical questions, how can we discuss that in a way that's a, maybe tact, more tactful, in a way that, that justifies why we're looking beneath the surface to explain why things are the way they are? And uh, we've been lucky, I've been lucky in my career to an extent, uh, because I've been able to ask those questions. Although I did leave a job in 1972 for asking critical questions about gender. And the Board of Regents in the state of Arizona found out about it, and they wanted me gone. That's when I went to the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. So I was going to have more freedom to ask critical questions there. Because I don't think you can do sociology without asking critical questions, without looking beneath the surface, without figuring out why things are the way they are. I think one of the ways that you have looked beneath the surface and been critical and and it's very important in the textbook. We've already discussed it, but I wanted to come back to, which is this idea of the great sports myth. And, and let, let me read what you what you have, what you wrote. Uh, sport, the great sports myth, as you define it, sports are naturally pure and good, and their purity and goodness are transferred to those who play, uh, consumes, or sponsors sports. Therefore, there is no need to ask critical questions about sports for the purpose of transforming them because they are already what they should be. Now, I grew up, as I've already said, with this belief myself. I mean, I bought into the great sports myth. So just calling it a myth feels provocative. And, and not just to me, but also to my students. They, they find this term, the great sports myth, um, pr provocative. Uh, so... Why, why for you, do you think it was so important to call it a myth and be provocative in that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it took me a long time to use that word. And it took a lot of, uh, what, negative feedback from, from other people. As I started talking about the way sports were organized and what, the data said about if if uh, if you want real social psychosocial development to occur with athletes, then we need to change some things that are going on in sport. And uh, you know, and people are starting to realize that, by the way, now with mental health issues, with injuries and uh, brain injuries in particular, uh, they're starting to ask those critical questions. But when I asked the, the critical questions, I got resistance. Uh, 
And that happened to me dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Even though I presented very good research that that was good methodologically, theoretically, and it came to pretty definitive kinds of conclusions. And when I presented that research, people just would not believe it. And I kept thinking, what is keeping them from accepting this, these facts? And, and I started to think, well, they're believing in a myth about sport that they have taken so seriously that if they accept these facts, it's going to create cognitive dissonance for them because they're going to have two conflicting uh, cognitive uh, ideas in their head at the same time. And that's really unsettling. So what they did was they rejected my facts and they held on to this notion that sport is naturally pure and good and so on. So, uh, so I started calling those beliefs, those sets of uh, uh, two beliefs that, that I've got in the chapter, a myth. And by the way, anthropologists have used the concept of myth as they try to understand how societies and cultures are organized. And myths serve purposes because they help maintain a particular structure so that things stay organized in ways that benefit some people more than others. And, and those people who are benefiting, they become the fans of the myth. They become the promoters of the myth. It helps them. They say we need uh, $6 billion of public money in Brazil uh, in order to sponsor the Olympics because the Olympics are pure and good and it's going to lead to positive forms of development for the people of Brazil, for Brazil as a country, and so on. And by the way, it's going to put a lot of cash in my pocket as that $6 billion filters through the economy. So uh, so I believe the myth if I'm one of those leaders of a sport organization in Brazil. and uh, Or if I'm uh, one of the sponsors whose products are going to be promoted in connection with the Olympics. So, uh, so there are people who benefit from myths and that's how myths get preserved. And it took me about 40 years, and that's no joke, 40 years to uh, read some anthropology about myths and say, this is what I'm dealing with. At first, I kind of uh, equated it to a religious faith, you know, where people, where people believe things on the basis of faith. And by the way, that faith is really helpful for a lot of people, by the way. That's why religions are popular. And, uh, and if you try to use facts to challenge someone's faith, you're out of luck because faith trumps facts. And in, in the sociology of sport, the way I've looked at things, myth trumps a lot of the facts that we've come up with through good research in the sociology of sport. So we're fighting in a sense, uh, a little battle here. How can we get by the myth and help sport become what people assume it is already doing? And, and when, we, when we show facts that mental health problems are being created within the context of sport, that when we say that injuries are creating long-term health problems for physical health problems, for people in sport and what we need to do is make some changes people go to the myth and say no but the door is starting to open there and it's opening in a lot of different ways uh, on on different issues so uh, it pays to kind of stick to your position when you're asking critical questions I think such a good way of understanding myth is that myths may not be empirical truths, 
based on observable evidence, but they're social truths. And so they tell us a lot about the world we live in. And I think it's it's also important to recognize, I mean, you've emphasized how myths serve the interests of the powerful, which is 100% true, but they don't, but that's not all they do. And, and I have like the example I always go back to, and I know I've told you this before, but I haven't said it on the podcast, when my younger son was starting high school and we were, you know, I was interviewing the athletic director and she was telling me about how uh, there's all these different clubs that students can participate in. And I asked about a flag football club because my my both of my boys grew up playing flag football. I coached them. They were very good at it. I always say my my son could have been the starting would have been the starting quarterback of the high school football team if I'd let him play and he wanted to play. And she, the athletic director, she was very resistant to a flag football club. And uh, and I said, but, you know, there's, you know, she was very, like, excited about the rugby club and the, the football team. And I said, there's all this research on brain trauma that, that says, you know, football and rugby, which I played both of those in high school, by the way, are are very dangerous. And her response was, yes, I don't believe that research. And so, again, the empirical evidence is there to demonstrate an empirical truth, but the social truth. And, you know, she doesn't really benefit materially from supporting football, a tackle football over flag football. But emotionally, she does. She identifies with um, with uh, with tackle football as a sport for boys. So this connects us to a very important concept in sports and society, which is the concept ideology. And and in that first chapter, you outline several different types of ideology, gender ideology, racial ideology, social class ideology, ableist ideology. And and most times when people hear the term ideology, you know, whether it's in the media or casual conversation, it means something that's just like not true or an illusion. You know, you can discount somebody else's argument by saying, oh, that's just ideological. Um, However, the chapter defines ideology as a shared interpretive framework that people use to make sense of their social worlds and evaluate themselves and others. Um, so I guess my question here is, um, if, 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 people, if, if people view ideology typically so negatively, why for you is it so important in the study of, of sports and, and society? Yeah, I think that people have a problem with with the term ideology and the whole concept of ideology in the political sphere because it really divides people there uh, because people have different ideologies. But most ideologies are widely shared within a culture. Uh, we have uh, an ideology related to gender that's widely shared. And and you start questioning that, uh, the assumptions, the ideological assumptions about maleness and femaleness, uh, about masculinity and femininity, about the presentation of self in connection with those ideas, and the roles of ma- men and women, males and females within society. When you start questioning that, you're going to get a lot of resistance. And we are seeing that right now all over the place. Uh, we'll talk about that later, too, with with intersex and, and transsexual and transgender participants in sports. Uh, people don't want to give up those shared beliefs. They've grown up with them. They are... They are very close in some ways to myths because they are the are the summaries of the social and cultural truths within a society. What people accept as truths. And when when people say the world is divided into men and women, males and females, that is a social truth that they have grown up with. 
There can be no exceptions to that. And uh, and when uh, they talk about race, uh, they have grown up with the classification system that puts people into racial categories that don't fit with facts. And but they've accepted them. History has been built around them. Our culture has been built around them. So in other words, racial ideology is a form of social and cultural truth that the vast majority of people accept. And when you question it, you're going to get pushback. And that's the same thing with, res with respect to social class and disability. There is, there is an ableist ideology, for example, that, uh, that consists of shared ideas and beliefs that are widely used to identify people as either physically or intellectually disabled and justifying treating them as inferior to people who are able intellectually and physically. And and that affects the organization of our social worlds, of our physical worlds and the physical spaces that we live in because we don't take into account disabilities when we're designing a city or a building or access or sidewalks or curbs. And that's what people with a disability, with physical, certain physical disabilities have objected to. We don't want to be dismissed because of this ideology, of this ableist ideology. We want to be taken into account as a real human being. That's the same thing with gender and the same thing with, with race. We want to be dealt with as a human being. We don't want to be classified in a box out of which we cannot escape. Uh, so, so that's... That's uh, what makes ideolo ideology a contested thing in many cases when you start questioning it because there's, it's shared. It's like the great sport myth. That's shared by so many people that when you question it, you're going to get pushback. And when you question certain ideologies, you're going to get pushback. But myths can change and so can ideologies. And we're seeing that right now in our own lives as the friends of my granddaughters are going through uh, transitions, gender and, and, and sexual transitions, and going through hormone treatments. And my granddaughters are friends with these people, and they accept their humanness apart from gender ideology. But other people are not doing that, and they're having one heck of a hard time accepting those people. They see them as either deviant, immoral, or unnatural. And the same thing has occurred with, in connection with race and in connection with disability. You know, dis being disabled makes you unnatural. It makes you different. And there was a moral component to that earlier in American history and still in other societies. If you have a certain kind of intellectual disability, they see you as morally flawed. And even with certain physical disabilities, they see you as morally flawed. So uh, those are the kinds of issues that we confront when we go look under the surface on issues related to ideology and things like the great sport no. I, I think putting together ideology and myth is so important because in my in my mind in the way I, I i study the world the two are linked so if the ideology are these social truths these social constructions that are related to empirical truths but they're not based on empirical truths there is a relationship there but they're they're not based on empirical fact they're these social truths these social constructions what the myths do these are the stories we tell ourselves to make our social truths appear natural and inevitable and that allows us to confuse a social truth 
for an empirical truth. And this is something that I'll struggle with, with, you know, students in class, particularly when we talk about um, transgender athletes in that chapter, um, sometimes with gender, sometimes with race. But everything that you're saying here is showing how sports as a sport as an institution connects to other institutions, race, the economy, um, media, class, so on and so forth. And, and that's why we have to be, um, we, ha we have to be interdisciplinary in our approach to the study of sport because sport never stands alone. It's not an institution unconnected to the media, unconnected to the economy, unconnected to broader populations, which means race, class, gender, sexuality, all of these things. And so it's it's so important for us to be able to make these connections. And we have to be interdisciplinary in our approach. And sports are thoroughly international. So we can't just look at sport in the United States, which makes so many people in the U.S. comfortable to imagine that we it's one of the myths we have in the United States is that, you know, we're a shining city on the hill with a different historical trajectory than any other nation in the world. And, and, and so that's that's, I think, the journey that we're taking uh, this semester going through the, the chapters of sports and society. Definitely. And by the way, the United States is not the only culture uh, within which that happens. So when I've worked in Brazil and taught there and, and done research there with colleagues, the great sport myth is is really powerful there and it's tied to their culture in ways that that prevent many people in brazil from asking any questions about the way soccer is organized for example and and some of their other sports so beach volleyball and the sports that are important within within their culture and so a a lot of people who who are sociologists or physical educators, they have a hard time asking critical questions uh, because they've grown up with with these myths and and these ideologies. So, uh, so being a sociologist is a challenge on the one hand, but it's really exciting on the other because, as you say, uh, when we study sport, we we go beyond the boundaries of our discipline because we're asking questions about the deeper game here in sport and that forces us to look at sport from different angles and it's one of the great things that i like about the sociology of sport when i go to a conference and you go to a conference we're meeting people from other disciplines they're asking questions from slightly different angles and we're learning from each other in ways that we wouldn't if we were all asking questions strictly from um, uh, within inside the disciplinary boundaries of sociology. And I think that's true also for the people reading this, reading the book, Sports and Society, and taking this sociology of sport class, uh, if you're not a sociology major, is again, being able to look at things from different perspectives, asking questions that people in your field who have, have accepted the myths. In sociology, we have our own myths, right? It's not, this is not unique to any single group of people. Myths operate everywhere. But to be able to question your own myths is such a valuable skill that uh, you can develop while you're in college. So I, I think we're, we're, we're running a bit long here on time. So we probably want to wrap up this first episode. And we've got a lot of other... Um, topics to, to, to get through in, in our coming episodes. So thank you so much, Jay. It's always a pleasure talking with you. So you're welcome. And I look forward to getting some critical feedback from our listeners.
Well, that is it for Chapter 1. Jay will, and I will be back in the next episode to discuss Chapter 2, Producing Knowledge About Sports in Society, How Knowledge is Produced in the Sociology of Sport, and we'll be looking forward to talking to you then.